haggard here. And uh, this is Zane. Huh? His name is Zane. He has a longer name than that. Hollywood something or other. Hollywood Zane. And uh, Zane was born in Montana. And there's a breeder up there that has a couple of stallions that I like. Produces nice minds on the horses. And I bought about 20 from that breeder last year. And uh, Zane was just a yearling then. He's just two now, huh? And uh, no saddle and no rider on at all. So this is Zane. Now one might ask the question, uh, so what if you went to Mongolia and worked with horses? Would they have the same language? Yep. Australia? Yep. Everywhere in the world. How does that figure? Well, horses 50 million years ago, uh, they, they emerged from one nucleus in North Africa. And for millions of years, they evolved in that North African area there and then slipped on up into southern Europe and then on to the steppes countries, Afghanistan and, and Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all up through there to create horse cultures as they went. They have some unique characteristics about their legs and feet, which take them on hot sand or the ice, either one. And uh, they, they are incredible animals that allowed men and women and families to get around, but not until about 6,000 years ago, for 47 million years, they lived on Earth with no human beings here, because Lucy, in Uldabai Gorge, discovered by Dr. Leakey, Lucy was about 3 million years ago, 3.2 million years ago. So we human beings have been around for about 3.2 million years, and they've been around for 50 million years. And then we say, wow, by golly, they ought to do what we want them to do, so we'll just tear into them like you saw on some of that footage today, and we'll just make sure that they know who's boss. And we just don't have that right. That's just, that's, that's no way to do it. And it, it, it's not right. So we're, we're managing to make some changes in that, as we've discussed. And here comes Zane now. And I'm going to put him through what you saw today. And you will see firsthand whether or not there is a language. You will see firsthand whether or not a horse can come to grips with dealing with a human being live and in person. It's as far as first saddle and first rider goes, he's, he's something around 13,000 for me. 70,000 horses I've worked with, but most of them were horses that somebody else had problems with. I'm just going to take this line away. And I'm going to use this silent language of eyes on eyes, shoulders square, which means go away. And so he does go away. And I'll use this line and throw it out there. Not that it could hurt him because it's a light as a feather line. And pain is not anything that I want anywhere near him. Pain wouldn't do me any good at all. I want him to never feel pain if he can, and yet be guided by the language. I would like it if nobody ever struck him in his entire life, but you can't wave a wand and dictate to people. And so I'm eyes on eyes, shoulders square, asking him to go away. You're going to forget that I'm saying eyes on eyes, and you're going to ask me later, or a lot of people do, when can I ever look my horse in the eye? When you want him to go away. Yeah, I know, but I mean, I just like to love him and look him in the eye. Well, it means go away. <laughs> so you can do that if you want to change their language, but it means go away. So I'm letting him go away, and he's answering the question. That's good. 
The only thing is, it's a round pin, and he keeps going around. That's the only place he can go. And that's why a round pin is good, because it doesn't stop the energy down in a corner somewhere. And about five laps, or about an eighth of a mile, is the flight distance on one direction. Could we pick that up just above the fence, please? Don't have anything down below, because it, it takes his attention away. That is just an extension of my arm. And the arm out, the hand open, really is a big go away. But I want him, I want him to realize that going away, in getting his, reaching his flight distance, is exactly the conversation I want because I want him to think about coming back to me, which he's just now beginning to do. So I'm going to turn him back around again and put him in the same direction that he initially traveled. And now look at this ear lock on me. You saw it on the video, now you see it here. You saw the smaller circle just then. The ear means I give you my attention, the smaller circle, Maybe I'd like to stop going away. And he was there, smaller circle, smaller circle. I'm beginning to drop the head. Now, licking and chewing. There it is. We're looking for four gestures. The ear, the smaller circle, licking and chewing, and dropping the head. And there they are. Just like it's written in the book. So he's bowing down. Very much like bowing in the Japanese culture, which does not mean subserviency. It simply means somebody has to be chairman of the meeting. And somebody has to bring the agenda to the meeting. And it's in deference to, not subserviency. So here's Zane going through the language just like you picked up the dictionary and took him through it word by word. And I'm still motion square, shoulders square, sending him away. Watch now as I open my right hand and show him the palm of my hand with my fingers open. I can speed him up and send him further from me like that. And then watch as I close this finger down, these fingers down, bring my hand down across my body, I can slow him down and cause him to drop his head. A language. Predictable, discernible, and effective. Transferring information from one entity to another. Zane is ready for join up now. Absolutely ready, completed the full conversation. And I just want to send him around here like that, and then I'll drop my eyes down, my shoulders on a 45 degree angle. And then I'm going to use my shoulders to invite him to come to me. We'll see if I can get him to decide to come to me. I'll work in arcs like this. Watch this arc now. Good boy. There's join up. The reward. Reticence. Nervousness. But I'll walk away and get follow up. Join up and follow up. Now I'd like him to follow me in two directions. That's the right turn and there's the left turn. Just to show that it's not a mistake or a coincidence. Hey Zane. Now 
I'm going to clip the line on. And I would like Zane to allow me into his vulnerable areas. It means that my hands can rub him here where the saddle's going to go. And this is where the cats go. So no horse is allowed in nature to let anything get up there on his back. So I want him to see that that's not going to hurt. And down here is where the dogs go. And horses don't want you in there either when they're wild and untrained. But my hands go in there and then cause him no pain and come out. And when that happens with no pain, the computer in his brain says, oh, that guy must be all right. Now I would like to pick up each foot one at a time. Giving you the legs is giving you their only weapons, really. their defense mechanism, and their weapons. No pain. You'll notice this horse has stripes on his legs, like that. That's going back to prehistoric times. Oops, 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 oops. That's going back to prehistoric times with a, a branch of Equus called Powalski's horse. There's still some around in Mongolia that have the zebra stripes. It's a time in evolution when the zebra and the horse separated. Okay, Clint. But the zebra stripes or zebra stripes on the legs will tell you that he has the DNA of that prehistoric horse closer than most horses that don't have those markings. A little bit unusual. That's a good boy. What a nice boy. Now I'm going to, he's happily coming with me here. So let's let him look at that saddle now. And that saddle pad. He, he won't know what that is. He's never had a saddle around him before. So he'll kind of look it over and be curious about it, I suppose. And I like to say that most horses would look at that and say, I know what it is, it's a wolf. Because anything that they don't have a fix on and a familiarity with, they have to take the position it's going to kill them. That's how they survive. Anything that's unusual, you get away from it. Now this is a pad with memory foam in it. Cutting edge substance, surface area. Memory foam is in the backs of the seats of the astronauts. Tempur mattresses. Now he may want to buck with that when he sees it there on his back. You can see that that's really bothering him. He's looking over his shoulder. And I want to put this saddle on. You saw this happen on video today. Right in this pen. So that's the first saddle of his life. And I'm just moving quite slowly and deliberately so as not to frighten him. And I'm going to put this strap around the front here so that if he should start to buck now, just that little string, he would break it loose. 
And then the saddle would come loose from him instead of being tied around his neck. If something like that were to happen, he could find pain from it and then it could go against what I'm trying to accomplish. Now the next thing is to get this belt around here and tighten it up and therein lies the big problem. Oh good boy, oh good boy, oh good boy. Because when that tightens up, the nerves there in that area just behind his elbow are going to be very touchy. As you're seeing the agitation now, but I keep my pulse rate down, I keep my adrenaline down. He's a good boy. And I try to stay as calm as I can. Now I've got those on there, so I'm gonna buckle this straight in. Now it can stay on there because the saddle is secure. Good boy. Now you see the horse saying, I told you I was going to buck it off. So he'll try to buck it off. Every time he flattens out like that and accepts it, I'll go very calm. Now, would you believe that just a couple of years ago, some people wrote a book about where to whip a horse when they buck with a long whip that you can reach and whip them? Because they said, when the horse is bucking, you have to whip them to show them that that's a bad thing to do. And all it does is just tell them that they have every reason to hate the saddle. I don't want to cause him any pain at all, whip or no whip. Nothing. I want him to be as comfortable as he can be at all times. And watch how fast he'll learn that that saddle isn't such a bad thing. So just maybe 10 or 12 seconds, and he's already saying, saddle's not so bad. Now, as he relieves himself here, As I move him around here, watch him go through the communication. His ear is already locked on me. You'll see there's the licking and chewing. There's the smaller circle looking over at me. Dropping the head is difficult when the girth is on that belt because it further tickles, but there it is. When he stretches his head down, then the girth will tickle him more. But let's just see now if he'll come to me, because if he'll come to me now, it's a big, big trophy for him. Because what's going on in his brain is when I'm near the human being, it's better. When I'm away from the human being, it's not so good. And that's exactly what we want to have happen. The way my father would do it would be to tie the horse up to one of these posts and then tie up a leg and then crash him to the ground, as you saw in the videos. Hey. Hello. Whipping, striking. And then the horse has to fight back. I don't know why they could. People ask me all the time, what do you, why do you think you're the first person to ever figure this out? I'm the worst person to ask that. Seems easy to me. But that's a little bit like one kid asking another, how did you learn to ride that bicycle? I don't know, I fell down a lot of times and pretty soon I could ride it. I just knew that my father had to be wrong with all of the brutality. It just couldn't be right. Nature couldn't have it that way. 
I was young and idealistic. And just didn't know any better. Easy now. Easy now. Oh, be still. You're okay. I'm not okay, Mr. Roberts. That tickles. Look what you've done now. Easy now. Easy now. There. This little strap here is going to hold these two stirrups together under his body. And as that happens, then I can use those stirrups as guides for these lines. Because I want to put both lines on so that in essence, I can ride him without getting on him. Or that is to say, I can cause him to be guided by the two lines without being in the saddle. And that gives Clint a chance to have a little bit of control over the horse before he gets up there. So, now, can you find your way around here with those lines on? So there's Zane in about, I don't know, 18 minutes or so, going around with the first saddle and the first lines on, stop the bucking already. Is Martina up there? Yeah, we'll clean up that before Clint gets on. But I'm going to make some turns here. Atta boy. That was the first right turn of his life with the lines on, so. And now a left turn. It's amazing the accelerated learning that you can achieve when you keep adrenaline down and fear is not in the scenario. I mean, he's more frightened than the horse in the field out there. But at the same time, nobody's caused him any pain, so he's not extremely frightened. Now I'd like to show you how quickly they will learn to be very sensitive to the reins, so that I can make turns with just two fingers on the lines, just like this. Nah. And they learn to have fun with it. Two fingers. And celebrate. They're really generous animals, and they they love to do things with you if they find you acceptable. Atta boy. Now I'd like Zane to stop, face away from me, and rein back a couple of steps. Easy, good boy. Stop, face away from me. This is an unnatural move now, but I'd like him to back up just like that. Perfect. Very, very good. About 22 minutes or so, accepting everything but Clint. We'll take these lines away now. Clint will bring in a set of reins to put on. Martina, you can take out that other line and that leather. Please. Easy, good boy. Now you see he's 
little bit concerned about Clint because he doesn't know him. 